Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I was last here in December when it was much colder and darker. Uh, you've got all the lovely weather here today, so it's a joy uh, to see that. Please uh, keep John 14 open in front of you. That will really help as we go through. Uh, let me pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for your spirit who um, is present among us as your word is preached. We pray that you'd be at work in us um, today by your spirit to soften our hearts, give us ears to hear and that we would uh, know and love and trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I perhaps be turned down slightly because now I can hear myself too much? <laughs> That's much better, thank you. Um, Nobody likes to say goodbye to a loved one, do they? At the moment, my little boy, uh, who's back at home at the minute, he's finding it particularly hard. He always wants mummy or daddy to stay just that little bit longer at bedtime before we say goodnight, before we leave his room. Just, just one more story, just one more minute, just stay and hold my hand. And my wife messaged me this morning saying, last night he woke up quite a few times saying, where's daddy? I want daddy. I wasn't there. I was staying, staying here. Um, so we try to reassure him. We make him promises. Don't worry, we'll just be in the other room. We'll be there in the night if you need us. We'll see you in the morning. We make him those promises and, and we keep them. Our passage this morning finds the disciples in the final hours before Jesus is taken away from them, before he will be arrested, tried, and crucified. They're his closest friends. For three years, they've been with him, listening, learning, living alongside him. And they love him. They love him deeply. And now they face the prospect of him being taken away. So in these last moments, alone with them, Jesus wants to prepare them for what's to come. He wants to remind them and make promises to them to reassure them that they won't be left alone that he will go but verse 16 I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth Jesus is going away nothing will change that but he will not leave them alone he will send another advocate it says another that means they've already got one Jesus is saying he is already an advocate with them. He's going to leave, but another will take his place. Someone like him. Someone to do the things that he has been doing. He will send the spirit of truth, or down in verse 26, the Holy Spirit. Not just anyone, not just a lackey, but the spirit of God himself. The third person of the Trinity to, to stand in for what they've lost, to to be present where Jesus has now gone himself. And he will be an advocate, although uh, perhaps you noticed the words on the screen were different from, from what we heard in the, the older uh, version of the NIV there. There is a lot of richness to the word used there. So advocate, someone who speaks on behalf of another, who pleads their case. But the, that word translated advocate, um, it means so much more than that. Literally, it means someone called uh, alongside. It can also mean counsellor, as we heard, or comforter, as we heard in the kids' spot. It can mean helper, encourager. It is a rich word. And there's no single English word that captures all that is encompassed by it. Jesus says the Spirit will come alongside in his absence. But the amazing thing is that Jesus actually says it is better this way. If you've got a Bible open, over in chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says, it is for your good that I'm going away. Because if he doesn't go, then he can't send the Spirit. So in these verses, Jesus begins to teach about the work of the Holy Spirit. He has much more to say in these chapters and in the rest of Scripture. The uh, Holy Spirit, there's so much that he does. But here we see three blessings that the Spirit brings. And as we begin to grasp these truths for ourselves, we will see that Jesus has richly supplied us, richly blessed us with all that we need to follow him while we wait for his return. So first of all, in verses 15 to 24, the Spirit brings Christ's presence. 15 to 24, the Spirit brings Christ's presence. 
Jesus promises that after his departure, we will know his presence through the Spirit. And in fact, as I said, it will be better this way, that we will have a far richer experience of his presence than was possible during his time on earth. So for Jesus to send the Spirit is better because the Spirit provides an experience of God's presence that is longer, deeper, and wider. It's longer because while Jesus was on earth, it was only for a short time. But verse 16, the Spirit will be with you forever. There's no time limit now on Christ's presence. The Spirit is poured out as a permanent gift, a permanent blessing that will never be taken away. It's longer. Secondly, it's deeper. It's deeper because while the disciples knew Jesus, um, as we know other people, as we see, see their faces, but we don't see inside their heads, just from the outside, verse 17, Jesus says, the Spirit lives with you and will be in you. Verse 23, my Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Just think about that for a moment. Doesn't it make your jaw drop that through the Spirit, God lives in us? He makes his home in our hearts. He is inside us, dwelling in us. We have a deeper experience of his presence. It's wider, so it's longer, it's deeper, it's wider, because while Jesus could only be in one place at one time as a man, He was in Jerusalem, he wasn't in Bethlehem, or he was in Bethlehem and he wasn't in Bethany. Uh, He could only be in one place at one time. But the Spirit can be anywhere, at any time. could be in more places uh, than one at a time. So it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in a crowded church, if you're at the top of a mountain on your own, if you're in the middle of a busy city surrounded by thousands of people. There's no queue, there's no crowd. Christ's presence is available whenever and wherever we need him. His presence is widely available, wider than when Jesus was on earth. We read in the Gospels, the crowd swarmed him. People tried to get near to him. But if you're at the back of the queue, you sort of, well, I'd like to, like to see Jesus, actually. But by the Spirit, there is no distance. It's longer, it's deeper, it's wider. We have access to Christ's Spirit, to Christ's presence by the Spirit. But even as Jesus promises his ongoing presence, he's also very clear that not everyone will receive this blessing. Verse 17, he says, The world cannot accept the Spirit, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now in John's Gospel, when he speaks of the world, he doesn't mean uh, the planet we live on, the planet Earth. Uh, The world, for John and for Jesus, means sinful humanity Uh, Everything that's in rebellion against God, everything that stands in opposition to him is disobedient to him. That's the world, our fallen human condition, our, our fallen human order of things. And that world cannot accept the Spirit, and so it cannot receive his blessings. But then the question is, well, who can receive the Spirit? Jesus says it uh, three times in this passage, again and again. It's there in verse 15, it's there in verse 21, and it's there in verse 23. Let me just pick up verse 23 um, with that. He says, "Uh, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Jesus will give the Spirit to those who love him and who show their love by obeying him. Now, we need to be clear here, Jesus isn't saying, certainly not saying, that we somehow earn God's love by our works, by what we do, by our own efforts. Because by nature, all of us are part of the world, that world in rebellion against God, that world that cannot accept God or his spirit. And that's true even of the apostles, If you've got the Bible in front of you, chapter 15, verse 19, just across the page, Jesus says, if you belonged to the world, it would would love you as your own. As it is, uh, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. His apostles, his closest friends, the people he's teaching right now, they they were part of the world. 
And Jesus came along and he took them out of the world. He rescued them from the world. He changed them. Every disciple of Jesus has been rescued from out of the world. And that's not something we do for ourselves. On our own, we cannot accept the Spirit. But Jesus came to save people out of the world. So it isn't that we obey God and somehow earn his love. But our love for Jesus is a response a response to the love he has shown us. So we show our love by our obedience. It's the same uh, in the way that I can tell you that I love my wife. I can say to my wife that I love her. But I show my love in all sorts of ways. Putting out the bins uh, in the evening, remembering to buy flowers and chocolates on our anniversary, all those little things that makes her go, yeah, he loves me. But I don't do those things to make her love me. I do them because I love her. They make my love visible. Love overflows into action. And to those who love Jesus, he will give the Holy Spirit. He will love us and make his home in our hearts. We will know Christ's presence. Now that doesn't mean that we will never find it hard to obey Jesus. But it means that we will want to obey Jesus. And if you struggle to obey Jesus, that's actually a good sign. Because it, if you're struggling, it means you're trying to obey Jesus. It means you're fighting. People who don't love Jesus don't mind if they don't obey him. The struggle to obey is a sign of life. It's a sign of love for the Lord. In verse 21, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. The Holy Spirit brings Christ's presence. Secondly, we see in verses 25 and 26, the Spirit brings Christ's truth. The Spirit brings Christ's truth, 25 and 26. Jesus says, verse 25, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. The Spirit will teach the apostles the truth. And we need to realise that that promise is specific to these guys, these apostles, gathered round Jesus in that upper room in these final hours. It's a word for them, first of all. They followed Jesus. They've taken in his teaching as they've listened, as they sat at his feet, as they've heard the words straight from his lips. But the danger is that once he's gone, they go, oh, what was it Jesus said? Oh, It's a really great story he told, but they didn't quite remember it. And as they tell it, maybe it starts to change. Maybe they overemphasize the bits they like. They underemphasize the bits that are hard. They distort it. It changes. It's not passed on faithfully. But Jesus promises them that the Holy Spirit will teach them and remind them. So they won't get things wrong. They won't twist the message. They will know the truth. And whereas uh, during uh, uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, they so often just miss the point and just read these chapters 14 to 17. Jesus is teaching, they're asking questions, he answers the questions, and they still don't get it. And um, you can read any of the Gospels and you'll find that almost every page, Jesus says something. They don't quite get the point. Jesus says something else to try and explain it. Um, And they still don't quite get it. They don't see. While he's there with them on earth, they can't see the whole picture. But the Spirit will come and will show them and teach them truths that they missed before. There's a great example of this, actually, uh, in John's Gospel earlier on. John chapter 2. The the Jewish authorities um, demand a sign from Jesus. And Jesus replies, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They're in the temple when he says this. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days. That's what happened at the time. They they didn't understand. uh, And the disciples didn't understand. But listen to the insight that John has as he sits down to write his gospel years later. Chapter 2, verse 21, he says, but the temple Jesus had spoken of was his body. He didn't know that at the time. That's what he realized later. 
And then he says, after he was raised from the dead, after Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled, remembered what he'd said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. That's the Holy Spirit at work. They didn't get it when they heard it. Sometime later, John sits down and goes, oh, I get it now. I didn't see, but by the Spirit reminding him, teaching him, he sees something that he missed before. He sees the truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He's teaching the apostles the truth. He's helping them to remember what Jesus said and did and helping them to make sense of it. Through the Spirit, Jesus is safeguarding the future of the church. He's preserving his teaching, ensuring it will be remembered rightly and passed on faithfully. First of all, from the lips of the apostles as they go person to person, preaching, proclaiming the name of Jesus. But later as they sit down to write the New Testament. When they came to to write his teaching down, the Spirit makes sure they did it reliably. The Spirit is at work to preserve God's word. And that means that the Bible we hold in our hands this morning is something we can trust. We can be sure that this is true because Jesus didn't leave anything to chance. He sent his Spirit to preserve his word, to ensure the teaching is passed on, to bring the truth to the world. Maybe a few weeks ago you were watching the coronation of the king, that great ceremony in Westminster Abbey. And at the beginning of that service, there's a moment where the king is handed a Bible. Maybe you remember it. And these are the words that they say as they do that. They say, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Isn't that amazing? That in Westminster Abbey, surrounded by all that pomp, all that majesty, Golden robes, jewel-encrusted swords, diamond-laden crowns. What's the most valuable thing on that day? In Westminster Abbey, all the great and good of the the nation there. The most valuable thing, the Bible. The most valuable thing this world affords, God's word. Is that what you think of the Bible? As you hold it in your hands now, is that what you think? You're holding something more precious than anything else on earth. Do you treasure the Bible? Do you delight in it? Do you open the Bible expectant, eager to hear God's voice? The Bible contains God's truth for our world. There's nothing more valuable, nothing more trustworthy. It was true back then when it was first written down. It's true now. It doesn't go out of date because the Spirit has made sure that it's true for all time. And the Spirit continues his work today as we open the word for ourselves, as we read it. He brings the words of Scripture to life as we take them into our hearts, as we take them on our lips, as we think about them in our minds. The Spirit provides Christ's truth. Finally, in verses 27 to 31, the Spirit brings Christ's peace. Christ's peace, verses 27 to 31. Jesus knows that what's about to happen to him might make it seem like evil has triumphed. He's going to be arrested, he's going to be falsely condemned, whipped, mocked and crucified. For the disciples, the coming hours and days will be full of grief. And so Jesus comforts them ahead of time, before these things happen. Verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus offers peace. Not just any peace, my peace, he says. The peace of the Son of God offered to his disciples. And he doesn't give as the world gives. Not something that will seem great, but then fall through. Not something temporary or fragile that will easily crumble when things don't go according to our plans. This is peace rooted in the fact that what's going to happen is what God has planned. The disciples will be shocked as Jesus goes to the cross. But Jesus knows this is why he's come. What looks like the triumph of evil 
is in fact the victory of God. Verse 30, Jesus says, the devil who uh, is coming well, has, has no hold over me. Verse 31, it is God's will that Jesus is doing. God's will he obeys. God's plans that are going to unfold on the cross. See, the disciples think they know what's best. They want Jesus to stay, and they think that would be better. But Jesus tells them off for this. He says God has a better plan. <clears throat> Verse 28, he says they in fact should be glad that he's going away, that he's going to the Father. He says God's plan is better than what they think is best for them. They need to trust him. They need to know that God's plans are better, even though they can't see it right now. And they need the Spirit to realise that, to bring that peace that Jesus offers to bear on their hearts. And that's a peace that Jesus offers to us today as well, wherever we are, in whatever circumstances we face. But it's hard, isn't it, when, when life is difficult, when we struggle, when we suffer, and we think we know what's best for us. We think, if this, this just changed, it'll all be all right. I think I've got my plan. I think, I think this would be best for me. We think we know what we need. But God's plans are what's best for us. Now, I don't know any of you really in this room. I don't know what you're going through, what troubles you might be facing, what things might be troubling your heart. But I don't need to know because Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Whatever that it is that's just at the back of your mind right now, Jesus knows. Whatever your situation, he offers you his peace. A peace that doesn't depend on circumstances. Peace that comes by the Holy Spirit. And a peace that um, later in Philippians, Paul will say it passes understanding. It doesn't make sense that the, the situation that you're in and the peace that you're feeling, they don't, they don't seem to fit. But that's because it's a peace that is not given as the world gives. It's Christ's peace. Christ's peace that doesn't depend on what's going on in our lives right now. Peace that passes understanding. So Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. The Holy Spirit brings Christ's peace. So here today, of course, we no longer have Jesus present physically with us. He's not sitting at the back of the church and going to shake his hand afterwards. But Jesus has not left us as orphans. This is part of his plan. He says this is better this way. Because by his Spirit, he, uh, we now can enjoy Christ's presence as he lives in us. We can know Christ's truth as we delight in his word. We can experience his peace as we face the troubles of this life. He has blessed us so richly with all that we need by his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit who lives in us as we love the Lord Jesus. Please, Lord, would you just make us aware of your presence in us? Would we not go through life thinking that you're distant, but knowing that as we trust you, you pour our spirits into, your heart, in, into our hearts so that we can know and love and trust you more. Thank you for your words that we hold in our hands and that we can trust completely. Thank you that it is your truth preserved and passed down through the ages by your spirit. Please bring it to life by your spirit as we read it, as we hear it. Please change us by it. And please, in whatever circumstances we're in this morning, would you bring us your peace? Thank you that we do not need to have troubled hearts, not because uh, you're going to make everything okay right now, but because you are with us in, us in our troubles and your peace surpasses all understanding. So please help us to know that peace this morning. Help us to rejoice in you and give you glory. Amen.